make uh, machines, but machines do fail us. <laughs> and so we we apologize for the last uh, for for starting now. So my name is George Ekonomignoli. I'm a Cameroonian by nationality. I have a master's degree in international relations and de uh, democracy from the University of Zigin, Germany. And also I have a master's degree in peace and conflict transformation. So um, today's event is about climate change and agriculture and food security in um, Africa. And uh, it's been organized by the Norwegian Council of Africa and also the International Seminar in Chomsk. So we are doing a kind of uh, a collaboration between International Seminar and the Norwegian Council for Africa. So today we are going to have uh, one of my, <laughs> my, my, <laughs> my best friends. So that's why today um, the seminar is kind of very important to me because one of the presenters is my childhood friend all the way from Egypt. So I'm so honored for him to travel all the way from Egypt to Chomso to give us some insight about what is happening. So um, our moderator for today's event is Larry. Larry is um, a P PhD candidate at UIT and he's from Ghana. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands to Larry. Thank you very much, um, George, and thank you all for coming today. It is a, this is a big stage, so sometimes I, I don't know, even though I'm tall, I feel like I'm short when I'm um, on a big stage like this. But with your cooperation, I hope that we can have a very smooth program and also have a very interactive program. Um, so George gave me an introduction. Um, there's nothing much to add, only that I'm into comparative indigenous studies. So my work here in terms of deals with how wind farms affect indigenous livelihoods. And so I'm comparing Norwegian and Canadian systems. So I'm hoping that is something that we can pick from the discussion of climate change in Africa and how adaptations have been made across the board. So, um, welcoming all the summit. My Norwegian is not very good, so welcome. After the program, if anyone has any intention of asking questions in Norwegian, be free to do so, and we would answer in English and have a translation for them afterwards. And also, as you see, one of our good friends is recording this program. The recording will only be for the speakers, and be sure that nobody will be recording you, and you won't see yourself on the internet. So still feel free to ask questions when um, the time comes for that. Okay, so today we're gonna to talk about climate change and adaptation. And as you know, the United Nations through the SDG has about 17 goals. And one of the key of these goals is goal 13. That has to do with climate action. But at the same time, there's SDG goal three. That also talks about zero hunger. And some of these SDG goals relate to each other in different ways. Some have argued that there are complexities, others said that there are contradictions. But what we do though, is that climate change affects everybody, even though the skills differ. In Africa, the 4% of global um, greenhouse gas emission can be found as a contributory factor from Africa. But most of the GHG, as they call it, um, are produced by the developed countries. Yet, African countries still have to deal with this. What is the solution? What is the way forward? And how can we, um, as a continent, as people, adapt to some of these climate um, disasters? So for us, um, today we have Martin Paul Tabi, all the way uh, from Egypt. He's Cameroonian. And I would like to read a bit about um, his background here. He's an associate research fellow at the Development Strategy and Governance Division of the International Food Policy and Research, called IFPRI, um, in Cairo. He holds a PhD in agricultural economics from the University of Bonn um, in Germany. Um, Michael, uh, he, is, he has an ongoing work which includes social protection and labor market um, outcomes. He has advised and consulted for the World Bank, the World Fish, um, and then ICRISAT, maybe he can throw lights on ICRISAT, and the German Development Institute. 
So without further ado, I would like to call uh, Martin Paul Tabi upon here. Michael. And then our second speaker, who is all the way um, in Accra, uh, joining us via Teams, is Basim Al Hassan. He will be speaking after Martin. He has over 10 years' experience um, as a standard work officer at the Ghana Standards Authority. He's an, an environmentalist and also an agronomist. Uh, he has his uh, Master of Science in Agriculture from the University of Ghana and also has a master's um, in soil science and agronomy from the Ehime University in Japan. So I think that we have some solid guys here to help us understand what this climate change adaptation all means. I mean, I am zero in terms of my knowledge about all of this. So we hope that this meeting would be a way for you to give us some information and also some kind of enlightenment on this topic. But before we start, how do you feel here? You are in Tromsø. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm very much excited, like, like everyone is, um, to see everybody sitting or to see everybody living. I'm in the evening, and I'm coming to listen to, to, to us talk about climate change adaptation. It shows, a lot of, it shows a lot of enthusiasm, right? So we are so concerned about our planet, we are so concerned about the future generations, and that's why um, climate adaptation, um, it's very important, of course. And it flows um, without saying that I'm um, seeing very senior people here also means that even those who are very old um, are also much concerned about the future generation. And um, I feel very elated um, to reflect on, on, on some of the work I've been doing on this area and kind of discuss this with you. Um, get your impression, um, and of course, improve both science, but also policy. But I, I saw that you came here with that like a jacket on, and I know that in Cairo it's a bit warm. Uh, do you have like some blood um, already that has an infusion of active? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, to be honest, um, when, I was, when, I was, when I was traveling two days ago, um, I wasn't certain because I've lived in Germany for like eight years. Um, and normally in September, it's really not cold. Like, it's really just exiting. Um, um, kind of the autumns and kind of it's really warm um, and in Egypt now it's like 40 degrees so it's pretty warm um, and when I was coming here I thought it's gonna be the same uh, but I was shocked like it's it's it's, it's a really very cold year <laughs> but yeah I think I think that's 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 all we're concerned about and yeah but I think I'm fine so. that's great um Basim you are can you hear us can Basim hear us Can Basim hear us? Well, yes, I can. Okay, um, all the way from Accra. How is the weather in Accra, and how is it for you to join us all the way from Accra, and we can see you here in Tromsø? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I mean, it's it's such an honor uh, to be invited to 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 be part of this um, great event. Um, Accra is is cool. Um, the weather has been uh, has not been that hot. I mean. Um, most of the time around um, June, July, August, it's, it's it's the peak of our, our rainy season. Unfortunately, this time around, the rain is delayed. Uh, I mean, and as well know, and uh, as we'll be talking about the effect of climate change, these are one of the reasons. And um, yeah, I think Accra is pretty okay. It's it's very cool, and I'm honored to be a part of this event. Yeah, thank you very much. I know you will talk more about the changing weather patterns and. Also, what you said about Accra's um, weather now, but I think at this time it's time for Martin to give us some presentation on the topic of climate change adaptation. Martin, take it over. Perfect. So I think it may be better to start this way. Yeah. So thank you very much for coming. Um, it's 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 my pleasure. And like Larry introduced, um, I'm Martin. Um, and I do a lot of a lot of research on, on, on many aspects of development economics, but also development studies and cultural economics. Uh, just been concerned um, about the rural um, farmer in many African countries. Um, and I work for the International Food Policy Research Institute, which is headquartered um, in Washington DC, but I'm, I'm, I'm outposted um, to do a lot of work on, on the Middle East and North African region, and I'm, I'm, I'm based in Cairo. Um, in Egypt, um, and it's my pleasure today to, to talk to you about climate change adaptation and agriculture um, and, and its implications um, for food security um, in Africa. 
So kind of as a way of setting the scene, um, we are so concerned um, about the three Cs. So, so kind of firstly, climate change has been on. Um, it's more or less a revolving topic. Everybody here knows um, what, what climate change is. Um, but even when climate change is hitting and affecting a lot of smallholder farmers in, in many African countries, especially in the MENA region um, where I work, um, there's high transaction costs, um, poor rural infrastructure, um, market infrastructure, and this is reflected in some of the work um, I've been doing. Um, and one key thing that also comes to mind when we think about how agriculture um, is rolling out in agriculture is this whole thing about climate change. So the big question is, what is climate change? So basically, the IPCC, that's the International Panel on, on Climate Change, defines um, climate change um, to be long-term shifts um, in agriculture and weather patterns. And if you look at this, this figure where I just try to, to display what happens, especially when it comes to the agricultural sector, is the fact that climate change causes a lot of erratic weather patterns. So I think that's, that's what the second speaker is going to talk about, how it changes um, the weather patterns, but also changes um, production seasons and the likes. Um, and like, like Larry mentioned already in the beginning, just the fact that we can think of the agricultural sector suffering from climate change, one should also be concerned that how does the agricultural sector contribute to climate change? And I'm going to talk about this in the slides ahead, but um, if you look at already, 80% um, of biodiversity is critically affected um, by climate change. And if we look at that, we see that 50% of all um, Westlands have been lost because of climate change, and this also uh, looks at um, aquatic ecosystems. And again, the, the big question that comes to our mind is what causes climate change? So, kind of, there are two causes. So, the, the proponents of climate change adaptation thinks that, or they think that climate change is basically caused by anthropogenic human activities. So, here we're thinking of things like deforestation, uh, we're thinking of unsustainable land use management practices. Um, so we are thinking of the burning of fossil fuels, uh, coal mines, yeah, and all of that. But of course, climate change is also caused naturally by variations um, in social activity. And if you think of the consequences of climate change, this is why we're worried, is the fact that we have a lot of intense droughts. So there are floodings, and, and this affects small water farmers. But also there is water scarcity, um, there is a lot of severe fires in many regions of the world, rising sea levels, um, the melting of polar ice, catastrophic storms, and declining biodiversity. So all of these consequences consequences have different implications for, for who, for wherever you are. Are you a small enough farmer? It has different implications on you. And they, um, these international organizations have been concerned about how to curb climate change. And we think that is what I'm going to be talking about. And for adaptation, um, there is a need for financing a lot of these various practices that go to, to support adaptation. And uh, the big question, again, is, is, is the fact that does climate change have any impact on agriculture? Um, and the question is, um, or the answer is yes. So kind of extreme weather events, they continue to have a lot of impact um, on agriculture in the world. And this has been proven in a lot of studies where we find that yields are reduced, um, and yields of cereals, but also yields of various staples in many African um, countries are, are reduced. And there's a lot of yield losses. So instead of getting a yield level of maybe 500 tons of, of, of maize, you find that because of climate change, it greatly reduces. And further exacerbating all these yield losses is the fact that climate change or these induced shocks lead to various crops, um, pests, and diseases. And one key pest and disease we can think of is, is this whole thing about fall armyworm, which just came like, like three or four years in Africa and is rampaging a lot of the production of many agricultural crops. And this map basically just shows you um, more of sub-Saharan Africa and how kind of yield losses are affected. So the red spots really show the yield losses. And this reflects also some of the countries I'm working on. So kind of that's what we call the sudan Sahelia zone. So there are a lot of yield losses, um, yield losses that relate a lot to cereals. And in many of these African countries, cereals are the main staples. So um, we rely a lot on the production of maize, but also the production of wheat, um, but also the production of sorghum, um, granules, and the likes. And these are staples that if households cannot um, produce, um, then it basically affects the food security. And now, so just, just getting more deep into the debate on climate change um, and agriculture, um, one would think that climate change has limited impacts on agriculture, but it's kind of, it's kind of a two-way relationship. So kind of the relationship between climate change and agriculture flows in two directions. So one could always definitely argue that um, climate change affects agriculture. But agriculture also affects climate change. Um, so basically, how does that happen? So kind of the production systems you do, um, is it sustainable or unsustainable? So the use of chemical fertilizers, the use of pesticides, um, basically help in the release of these anthropogenic greenhouse gases 
um, that also contribute um, to climate change. And if we think of the fact that climate change and agriculture are related, um, one key thing that we could do to support farmers is the fact that uh, we could look at ag as agriculture as a key entry or even conventional agriculture that is more that is more that is more um, sustainable. So it basically entails you producing for yourself, making sure that um, you have what to feed, but also being concerned about the next generations. So you are doing things very sustainably and not doing things on un sustainably. And it has three pillars, um, which many proponents call the three wins of climate smart agriculture. So the first thing is it basically increases um, food produ production, productivity, and incomes. And if that's the case, then we should, be, we should be worried that, okay, if it increases food production, if it increases food security, um, what is this concern about its sustainability? Um, are we producing today and looking at the needs of the future generations of our children yet to come? And the fact that the second strong pillar is the fact that it strengthens resilience to climate change. So in the face of these many changing weather patterns, climate smart agriculture has been shown to potentially um, still basically build resilience. And I'll show you in the next slide how this um, happens with some of the research I've done. And also, it basically reduces greenhouse gas emissions, which speaks more to its sustainability. So this is how the aspects of climate change are mitigation. Um, but despite these proven characteristics, which I can describe as the triple wins um, of, climate, of, of climate smart agriculture, um, its adoption in many African countries have been very low. And now, um, the quick question is, uh, what could be causing this low adoption of these climate smart agricultural practices? So basically, the literature highlights that missing markets, market imperfections, um, liquidity constraints, all sorts of poor, uh, but also lack of information um, are things that are driving the low adoption of these important um, climate smart agricultural practices. And, and given this, um, we researchers have seen that there are very little studies that basically consider um, climate change, how it impacts and also, production. Given that these climate um, smart agriculture practices are important, um, I'm also providing answers to the fact that what are the drivers of this adoption to answer the question or to answer these more policy relevant questions. And the preview of my findings, I know I've been talking a lot and maybe I've been so boring. Um, so, but if you want to go now, before you go, make sure you listen to my pre, uh, my, 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 the findings of, of some of the work I've been doing. So, um, we find that with my co authors, uh, definitely, that the adoption of these climate smart agricultural practices increases um, land productivity. And so, some of these practices um, are the use of improved um, climate smart varieties. So, kind of these are varieties that have been bred to be resistant to extreme weather events, to be resistant to floods, to be resistant to, to very dry areas, especially in the semi arid and arid zones. Um, also, some of these practices include um, growing legumes, but also intercropping these legumes. So you plant legumes like granite, uh, but, but you intercrop them with um, some other cereals like maize, um, sorghum, um, wheat, teff, um, but also the use of organic fertilizers. Instead of using chemical or inorganic um, fertilizers, you use more of um, organic fertilizers. We find that it increases yields. And also we find that um, the farmers that use these climate smart agricultural practices um, have an improved food security, so they are more diverse in their food consumption and they consume more nutritionally valued foods. Um, also, um, we find that the bundled use of these um, climate smart agricultural practices really matter for yield um, increases um, with greater implications um, for greater caloric um, intake. And then we find out, so this is, this is what in Ethiopia, we find that various um, Climate smart practices like climate, uh, like improve climate smart varieties, crop rotation. Where this year you're going to plant um, this crop, and the next year you allow the crop to follow. You move to another fallow land, um, and conservation tillage where you don't actually till the soil to to make it lose um, some of it, some of its very interesting nutrients. It builds climate resilience and. Um, with this, I will now um, bring us to the conclusion that um, climate smart agriculture um, is food and nutrition sensitive with a lot of implications for food security um, in many African countries. So kind of mo mo much of the work I've done, like I mentioned, um, um, has been based on analysis from, from Ghana, from Mali, from Nigeria, Ethiopia, um, Cameroon, and Kenya. And with this, I do a lot of household surveys. So I, I, I go to farmers, we collect household surveys, we talk to them, we visit their plots, um, and uh, we, we, we work a lot in different villages and in different sam sampling areas. So, kind of over time, we collect data. So, in like in Ethiopia, we have data from 2010 to 2015, and in Ghana, Mali, and Nigeria, we have data that spans between 2017 and 2019. And this is very rich panel data and also plot level data. 
And the farming systems we look at in these African countries, especially for Ghana, Mali, um, and Nigeria, are single crop farming systems. So these are farmers that grow granuts. But also, like I mentioned, one big climate smart agriculture practice is that if you're growing granite, which is a legume, you intercrop it um, with other cereals um, like maize, um, but also sorghum. And the importance of, of looking at granules, um, why I really like the, the work we do is the fact that um, in, the, in, the, in the time of many talks about gender equality, we focus on a crop um, which has been referred uh, by many authors as a woman's crop, right? So um, it's not just a woman's crop, but it's a crop um, that is climate smart um, and can support the fight um, for climate change adaptation. So the importance about granite cannot be overemphasized. So for those who are real agronomists, they know that granite is a C4 plant um, that basically synthesizes atmospheric nitrogen. And if it synthesizes atmospheric nitrogen, um, and like I mentioned, is grown in intercropping with other crops, it means that it increases soil fertility. So instead of you to apply a lot of chemical fertilizers, if you're growing maize, the maize directly relies on the cultivation of granules because it produces these root nodules that improve soil fertility. So kind of the, the, the maize relies on that and it reduces the use of inorganic or chemical fertilizers. And granite has a lot of nutritional value. So it's one crop that runs through a lot of advantages. So it's both considered a fat and an oil, but it's also considered a protein. And if you think of the fact that the direct um, substitutes of proteins in many African countries are fish and meat, and households are cash trapped and they cannot buy fish and meat, then they can consume um, granules to improve on their nutrition. So um, this, this has made us to, in many of our studies, to refer to granules as a crop that is not only climate smart, but is poor, poor. Um, and environmental friendly because it supports um, a lot of the environmental goals. But also in Ethiopia, we look at multi cropping systems where farmers are cultivating wheat, they're cultivating turf, they're cultivating barley, and they're cultivating maize. And, and because of these multi cropping systems, I mean, it's heavily supported by the various um, Ethiopian um, governments under what they call a cluster based development approach. And in some work that I've done, we've seen that the cultivation of, the, of these crops are basically inclusive because they're mostly cultivated by small water farmers. And because they're cultivated, by small water farmers, they improve poverty um, in many um, rural areas. And so far, some of the descriptive, uh, the descriptive snapshot of some of the results um, that we have is the fact that in our data we observe that the adoption of climate smart agriculture it's pretty low and varying in the various countries. So, kind of, we rely on, a, we look at different practices like crop rotation, the use of these improved seeds, um, organic fertilizers, intercropping, where, like I mentioned, you plant granite and you're planting maize um, at the same time. And you find that there's a lot of variation. So, kind of, one, one, one key question we're asking ourselves is why do we observe this variation and why is adoption still low, despite the fact that it's very beneficial? I'm going to provide access as we go ahead. Um, but also, with insights from Cameroon and Kenya, we find kind of the same thing. And one key thing that I want to mention with this um, slide is the fact that uh, there's a lot of context. So kind of the situation in Cameroon, the situation in Ethiopia, the situation in Mali, it's different from the situation in these different areas. And kind of this various heterogeneity kind of speaks to the fact that we cannot just have a bundled policy for, for climate smart agriculture in many African countries, because different countries have different realities. They have different institutional um, background. But also, like I mentioned, we're also looking at what, what drives the low adoption of these practices. And one key thing um, that the literature has highlighted is the fact that these practices are there, but it may be the case that farmers don't know about these practices. So we wanted to see how access to information matters in the adoption of these practices. And if we can look at this already, we see that farmers that have access to information are more likely to adopt um, these various practices um, in the various countries like crop rotation, the use of improved seeds, um, intercropping, um, and organic fertilizers. And now so much deep into some of the econometric or some of the simulation results we have is the fact that when we look at the relationship between the adoption of these climate smart practices um, and production or the increase in yields, um, we find that the adoption of these practices basically improves production. It improves um, also the production value that is what farmers get um, from what they sell, but it also increases yields. And one could think that the adoption of these practices increases yields increases production and food security. But like I mentioned already, or like I alluded to in the beginning, um, the production, uh, the adoption of these practices are very low. So we wanted to understand why do we observe low adoption? So we looked at 
various institutional mechanisms in these countries. And one key thing is agricultural extension. So agricultural extension is a bundled group of services provided by many governments in Africa. Basically, that involves a lot of information exchange with farmers. So basically, um, these are people we work, uh, who work with the government and they go to tell the farmers that you have to use this information, you have to do this, um, this is beneficial for you. So it's more or less like an informal training for farmers. The literature shows that farmers that have access to, to greater wealth um, they also adopt because some of these practices are not provided free to farmers. So, giving an example like improved seeds, these seeds are really expensive for farmers. And like I mentioned, uh, poverty is still an issue for many of the smaller farmers in many rural areas. So, even if they have this information but they don't have the money, they'll not buy these improved seeds and then um, they'll not uh, adopt this, this, this kind of smart agricultural practices. Um, and finally, moving beyond this whole um, external constraints to adoption. Um, we've also looked at behavioral factors of adoption because this whole thing about climate change is so behavioral, right? It's not just about saying that farmers lack access to, to finance, um, they, lack, they, they, they don't have the right information for adoption, but we also look at, at kind of the internal constraints of farmers, so psychological factors. And in this, we show that aspirations um, also matter in driving the adoption of this climate smart agriculture. And this is results from both Cameroon um, and Kenya. And now we did some heterogeneity analysis where we're now concerned that if farmers adopt this uh, variety, um, who benefits more? So that's always a key question for policy, like if we give farmers improved seeds, who are those who are going to benefit? Is it the poor farmers or the richer farmers? And this is a very strong result because we observed that um, adoption of these climate smart agricultural practices um, benefits all households. But kind of we see that it is decreasing, right? It means it benefits poorer households than richer households. This is a very strong result um, that we like so much because many development interventions have been biased by the fact that there's a lot of elite capture such that when you think that you give um, farmers access to these things, um, it never goes to the real poor farmers, to the very um, vulnerable farmers. And now based on, on, on these results, um, um, uh, we, we, we conclude with a lot of results. So the first thing is, um, Kind of we should boost the adoption of climate smart agricultural practices and this entails kind of developing upscaling disseminating um, these practices as they are important in building climate resilience and the true agricultural transformation but also um, one key thing that we talk about the adoption of these practices is the fact that um, information access is key to its adoption um, um, I've made a case for the fact that climate financing is really important, right? So we're talking about climate adaptation, uh, there needs to be financing to, to support these farmers, and financing is, is not just enough. Um, there should be a lot of improved targeting, um, uh, so such that the, this, these practices go to the people who need them, and there should not just be a lot of allied capture. And of course, to, like this is something we've discussed a lot in research and policy circles, that the rural and market infrastructure of many African um, rural societies need to be strengthened because if these are not strengthened, we'll always have this whole um, aspect of information um, asymmetry. And lastly, um, we are craving for the fact that uh, there should be a lot of support to rural um, and farmer institutions. And with this, um, the keynote insights um, that I'm, I'm providing uh, while you go home and you think of um, is the fact that firstly, Africa is at, Africa is at a tipping point. Um, there are a lot of shocks um, um, Africa is facing, but also the global world. Um, we are facing a lot of economic shocks. We are facing COVID, we are facing climate change, we are facing um, the Russian um, Ukraine war. Um, of course, COVID started um, kind of as a, as, as a health crisis, but before we knew it, it turned into an economic crisis affecting um, food systems um, globally. Also, um, Africa does not contribute a lot to climate change, but it suffers immensely from the consequences um, of climate change. Um, and this makes us to think that fighting global um, uh, climate change is a global and collective effort. It needs, uh, we need to have all hands on deck um, for reaching the triple wins of increasing uh, productivity and food security um, in Africa, uh, but also of making sure that um, adaptation and mitigation are things which run through to all um, smaller households. And key in this is the fact that um, there should be the doubling of, of, of adaptation finance. And I was listening um, just two days ago to the Just Ended Africa Adaptation Summit, where basically uh, most heads of states and, and, and many um, partners on development in Africa were stressing the fact that um, there should be a lot of increase in climate change adaptation financing. And this basically flows from the COP26, which was held in Glasgow. And many African nations were saying that um, we need to support Africa 
in building its adaptation, right? Because uh, Africa doesn't contribute a lot to, to, to the emission of greenhouse gases, but it suffers a lot from, from that. But one key thing uh, we need to mention here is the fact that it's not just enough to talk. Uh, many times we need to walk the talk. Uh, we need to turn all the speeches um, into, into action. So kind of, uh, I'm also joining my voice to, 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 with the heads of states to say that um, there needs to be a doubling um, of climate adaptation um, financing. Um, and in as much as adaptation is important, I want to end with a caveat here. So kind of um, like I've mentioned in these six countries that we've studied, um, adaptation is highly context specific. So kind of what happens in Cameroon may not be the same as in Egypt, may not be the same um, as in Sudan, may not be the same um, as in Ethiopia. And in that, um, adaptation may also not be a panacea if it's not all planned. So um, I've mentioned that climate um, adaptation may improve, may improve yields, may improve production, uh, with a lot of ensuing impacts on food security, but it may not be a panacea if it's not well planned. So there's, there's been a lot of studies that shows uh, what we describe as maladaptation. So if you don't plan adap adaptation very well, if you don't get the funding right, if you don't make sure everything's planned from the beginning, you find that households rather suffer from adaptation. So kind of it's important that when we are planning various adaptation programs, we think of the, the role of context um, in these various um, adaptation. And with this, um, I end by saying that the, the time to act is now. Um, and in that, I also say, uh, end with this very nice African project that says that um, if you carry your own water, you know the value of every drop. And the value lies in the story of climate change in Africa, the livelihoods that um, it is affecting in Africa. And with this, um, I say thank you. Um, I look forward to um, a very nice um, discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, uh, for such an elaboration and also dissemination of your results findings. Um, I know you mentioned the three C's at the beginning about the, about climate change, about COVID, and then the conflict, but you focused on the climate change. But just to satisfy our curiosity, what I know about 30% of wheat production um, comes from Ukraine, of the world's uh, consumption of wheat comes from Ukraine and Russia combined and about 80% of sunflower seed products also come from the same region. Um, does, does this make a case for Africa to adopt smart, uh, primary smart um, conditions as you, you've spoken about, right? Yeah, sure, that's, that's, that's very important. And, and, and the good thing is I, I still do a lot of research in this line. So that's something we've been very concerned um, about from our office in, in Egypt, because Egypt relies a lot um, on the importation of wheat um, from, from, from Russia and Ukraine. And when this whole conflict started, um, Egypt could not have um, wheat um, from that, and it was basically affecting farmers. And kind of there was a lot of tension um, among farmers, and directly because of this whole macroeconomic effect, it led to this big inflation that, again, the farmers are still um, suffering. But one key thing we had, um, we're highlighting a lot in our policy talks um, is the fact that we need to rely on internal production, right? So kind of we can also produce um, the wheat we eat domestically, and if we look at some of the climate smart agricultural practices, um, like the use of improved seeds, um, we find that um, these are things which have been proven to increase um, production, productivity, and yields. And the problem in Egypt is the fact that it has a great population. So just like in many African countries where you find that population is increasing, um, there's a lot of production, but production is never able to meet um, the great population. And one key thing is that uh, we're highlighting to, to many governments is the fact that um, we should boost internal production. And like I've highlighted in my presentation, one way of boosting um, uh, production is through the use of these improved seeds, but also um, using these improved seeds with other production technologies. And some other things um, beyond um, climate smart agriculture is the fact that but this relates more to trade. So kind of there should be a lot of diversification. We should not just rely a lot on importing from, from Russia and Ukraine or just from producing from ourselves, but we could also diversify kind of our, our importing partners. Great. Um, we would get into it more and when we get to, to the questions and answer sessions. So now we would have to travel to Accra, um, <laughs> where Basim Al Hassan um, sits and then wait for us. Basim, Basim, we've heard a presentation of Martin. And if there's a comment or two you'd like to pass on before you start, please go ahead. I think you are muted, you know, these things we don't always get our head around it. You are muted.
Yes, sir. Yes, thank you very much. I mean, uh, you have to keep reminding me about the fact that uh, I have to be conscious about um, being um, muted and um, muted as you move along. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Larry, and my fellow um, panel speaker. Um, I think it's a very wonderful insight. Um, I think that of course, I will have um, a little, maybe just to add to what uh, has already been presented. So, yes, I think it, it, it was an excellent presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, um, it's such an honor to be invited to be a part of this uh, discussion. Um, the issues of climate are very, very important, um, especially in this 21st century. Um, basically, this is going to be the outline of my presentation. Uh, I'll be talking uh, about the security in brief, how we look at culture, uh, climate change and global warming, um, basically about the concept, impact on, on food security in Africa, and then some adaptation and mitigation measures, and then intervention by African government, but I'll be um, pinning it down to the situation in Ghana, what uh, the Ghanaian government have been able to, to do in this regard in terms of uh, um, providing um, policies to, to support um, food security and climate change. So, so um, basically, um, we're talking about food security and, um, for instance, in our situation in Africa, um, it means that the entire population of Africa at the moment, uh, mass stance is 1.4 billion to expand all around the 4 billion um, the population of the entire African continent that at all times um, should have equitable and stable food distribution uh, that is safe and meet their needs. Um, but of course, this um, brings us to the main um, dimensions of food security, um, um, food availability. I mean, basically, um, looking at um, production and etc. And then, um, Looking at accessibility, so the purchasing power of the consumer, uh, and then utilization. So what it is that when food is assimilated, the consumer is supposed to, uh, to benefit from. So in this um, situation, one key um, um, component to all of this is food safety. Um, so the assurance that whatever it is that we are going to consume will not be injurious to 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 us, and that is. I think they're very important. So it isn't just about the availability of the food or the food being accessible, but then it's safety. And then we also talk about the stability of crime. So recently, um, it's, it's it's an issue, especially in Ghana, um, where we have been um, food inflation um, rising. In fact, according to the Ghana Statistical Service, uh, food inflation currently stands at 32%, and that is really, really worrying and a threat to um, for security. So what's the outlook of agriculture globally? Um, basically, um, as has already been projected, the world population is supposed to hit uh, um, 9 billion by the year 2050. Um, and that's, um, and this will mean that there has to be a corresponding um, 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 increase in terms of food production to be able to feed this uh, increasing um, population. But again, um, the statistics has it that about 5173 million people are actually at risk of hunger. Out of these, close to 51 million um, make up the entire um, African population, which represents about 26%. And again, if um, considering the fact that we are supposed to really um, meet the um, the attainment of the SDGs by the year 2030, especially that of SDG2 that has to do with zero hunger, then this is really, really a, point, um, a cause of concern. Um, the situation in Africa is such that uh, most of the um, agriculture that we do are rampant, basically practiced by smallholder farmers, uh, with their contribution being around 23 to 30 percent to their various um, those domestic products of their different countries. Now, um, according to UNEP, um, 
and cultural uh, productivity in the continent is actually in the decline. In fact, it has been projected that it will uh, decline uh, up to 35 percent by the year 2080. And why or what is causing this decline in the productivity of agriculture? Basically, uh, it's a lot of investment in the sector, um, and then also the issues to do with um, increased greenhouse gas emission um, that's contributing to the global and climate change. But we look at this graph critically. Um, so we look at this graph um, critically. You realize that, um, okay, this is a graph that shows the chemical fertilizer usage um, per area. And on the vertical axis is the amount of fertilizers um, in kilograms per hectare, and then the horizontal axis having the different uh, regions. So you have Af uh, Africa, um, the Americans, the Asians, the Europe, the Oceania, and then the world. I realize that um, in the year 2018, um, the total um, amount of chemical fertilizers used actually in, in Africa is moving around 20 kilograms per hectare. Now, comparing that to the world average, realize that the world average is doing around 120 kilograms per hectare, and that is really, really way low. And that is why um, the lack of investment in, in the provision of fertilizers to support agriculture is, is, is a big problem. And that is why the agricultural um, in, uh, productivity in Africa is actually going down or on the decline. Now again, there, there's also the issue with um, greenhouse gas emission, like I indicated. Um, of course, I mean, as has already been um, indicated by the previous uh, speaker, the, the entire contribution of um, greenhouse gas um, from Africa is um, um, 44 percent, which is way uh, four times lower than the global um, emission. Um, but of course, if you look at the emission from, or the global emission from, um, from the world and in terms of agriculture is doing around 16%. Um, um, that's if you look at um, it, if you look at it from a 17 year span from 2000 to 2017, and with a chunk of it coming from the dairy fermentation from uh, livestock um, production. So clearly you can um, see from this that um, agriculture is, is is a part of a problem and then at the same time a solution to, to climate change. So um, what is this thing about the global warming? Basically, it's just the rise in uh, global temperatures, mainly due to uh, the increases in uh, the greenhouse gas uh, or in the greenhouse gases we have in our atmosphere. If you look at this graph critically, and this is a graph um, which is actually uh, showing the global temperature and CO2 um, from the 19th century all the way until the 21st century. Realize that there's actually an exponential rise uh, in terms of the, the CO2 and then the global temperature uh, if you move all the way from the 19th century through to the 21st century. And what is uh, actually accounting for the rise um, in, um, in the global temperature. We'll see that in a bit. But basically, um, the main greenhouse gases, as, as have been indicated in, in um, literature, are mainly water vapor, uh, which is the most uh, commonest. We're having also uh, carbon dioxide gases, which are produced from the burning of fossil fuels. We have the thing, like I indicated, from the digestive uh, system of um, livestock. We also have uh, nitrous oxide, which is mainly coming from agricultural lands um, as a result of the application of um, nitrogen-based fertilizers. So like I indicated, um, let's try to look at the brief uh, concept of uh, greenhouse gas effect. Um, because in the past 35 years, there has been an increase in the concentration of the, um, these um, greenhouse gases. Um, what happened is that when um, short wave radiation from the sun hits it's our air, um, those that are absorbed by either tree canopy are absorbed, those that will be absorbed um, by the ground are also absorbed. But what it is that it's reflected back um, into this or into the atmosphere or into space will be in the form of long wave radiation. But because the concentration of these gases have increased in the past 35 years, they are actually able to trap these radiations, leaving um, the, um, our atmosphere that they are able to trap them and by so doing 
um, increasing the global temperature. And once the global temperature or our, our, the atmospheric temperature increases, it results in the warming of our globe. And this is basically um, how um, this uh, concept of greenhouse effect happens. So, um, looking at the impact of climate change on uh, food security in Africa, um, basically, um, yes, like I indicated, um, the, the, the trend is that the um, concentration of um, these gases are increasing, which is leading to um, increasing in the um, global temperatures or so the temperature that are affecting um, the ability to predict uniform patterns correctly. Um, this graph actually um, is an African map and it shows the areas where um, um, it shows areas that are prone to flooding. So areas prone to flooding are in blue. You look at the entire um, West African sub-region countries like Sierra Leone, Ghana, Togo, Benin, Nigeria, and etc. Some part of Central Africa, um, Cameroon, and some also parts of um, Southern Africa. These areas are prone to flooding. Um, you look at um, the region of the Sahara zone, you find that countries that countries like Niger, Chad, and Mauritania are actually experiencing um, drought. And this is um, um, a problem because this will um, result in um, starvation of livestock and um, poor germination of crops. So this is just to show uh, one of the pictures um, that um, we've um, witnessed in, in, in the continent. Um, this maize farm that has been um, flooded, and again to the right is actually a maize farmer's field that is seriously challenged with drought. Let's look at the food insecurity levels by region. Again, on the vertical axis is the percentages. Um, you look at the food insecurity, you realize again that um, you look at um, Africa from 2014 to 2019, you look at the percentages averages. In 2014, it's just a little above 46%, uh, percent, and in 2019, it increased again to um, 50, 52%. Now, comparing this to Asia, to Latin America, Northern America, Oceania, and even the world, I will realize that uh, the percentages of Africa in both 2014 and 2019 are way higher. And um, that is, unfortunately, the, uh, the reality on the ground. That is why. Um, um, climate change um, has to be um, tackled head on, rather than um, we try to bring this percentage down. Again, um, a study is also carried out by Carbon um, Disclosure Project, also um, find, uh, found out uh, some of the cities that are actually uh, at the mercy of the strike. Uh, 16 um, cities have actually um, reported internet biological hazards. Uh, 24 also um, recording or reporting 25 water scarcity. 19 uh, recording 21, um, 19 cities uh, reporting 21 extreme precipitation. Um, and, and again, 22 cities actually recording or reporting 33 extreme temperatures. And this is um, a huge concern. But let's try to look at the effect of climate change in um, Ghana. Um, so basically, as has already been projected, and mean and temperature is supposed to increase from one to three degrees uh, in the year 2060, and then from one from five to five point two in, uh, by 2090. Um, recently, also because of the disparity in in in, in annual temperatures, we are having uh, to do with uh, low productivity in terms of yields of some of our cash crops. Um, so we're talking about Cassava yields and uh, maize yields are um, declining. Um, and again, um, from 1991 to actually 2008, Ghana recorded six million floods uh, with more than two million people affected, and this is uh, very, very worrying. Um, last, um, last, um, last year, yes, the ending part of last year, um, Ghana at uh, the the coastal part of Volta region actually experienced uh, tidal waves. Um, a lot of the communities uh, at the coastal side are mainly fishermen or uh, just engaged in fishing. And when the waves uh, came in, I mean, it destroyed their, 
their their livelihoods and 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 they needed support and um, it's it's it was it was really an eyesore um, seeing how the tidal wave actually affected the people. Uh, recently, we are also having issues to do with um, longer periods of summer time. <coughs> And again, there is also um, um, issues to do with um, decreasing soil fertility trend, and basically, because of the increasing in the temperatures um, in our country today, I mean, there is there is the, the issue that has to do with the faster uh, rate of the decomposition of um, organic carbon in our soils, and um, that is a source of concern. So let's um, kind of zone into the. African uh, continent, I'll just pick on some few countries. So, for instance, in the Gambia, it has been indicated that um, in, in the next um, 40 to 50 years, the entire uh, administrative capital, Banjo, um, will be wiped off as a result of um, um, sea level rise. Um, in Ethiopia, there, um, it has been found that there is actually a, a, a correlation between economic growth and growth from variability, um, which means that um, where 10 years are associated with higher GDP growth, Whereas the areas are affected with um, lower or even negative outlook. The situation in Tanzania is also that um, there's also um, a reduction um, in terms of um, maize, um, sorghum, and rice. In South Africa, same. Um, we're also um, having issues to do with um, 1.3 million households experiencing hunger. Um, in Cameroon, um, there, there, there has, um, there's actually been um, issues to do with um, the impact um, from the volcanic eruption from Mount Cameroon. And so whenever there is um, a volcano, there's a release of um, these gases, and these gases actually um, also contribute to global warming and climate change. So what are the adaptation measures? Um, according to uh, UNEP, they've actually come out with um, uh, the ecosystem-based adaptations, which is mainly because uh, preservation, sustainable management, and restoration of ecosystem. The previous speaker have um, spoken at length, so I'll just move on. Uh, with regards to the mitigation uh, strategies, of course, there has to be um, a um, frantic effort um, made by, by policy makers to reduce the emission of these gases, as well as also to maintain and um, to, to, to try to um, recover sorts of areas affected by climate change. One other thing that will um, help is also afforestation. And by, and by afforestation, we are able to um, um, do trees that have the capacity to clean up or to pick up um, CO2 into the atmosphere, thereby reducing the concentration of CO2 gases. Again, um, the application of compost or biochar or a combination of both um, um, is also um, important. And for instance, um, in my master's studies, I've actually affirmed that yes, when you combine um, biochar or you apply biochar or compost or with even a fertilizer, um, it actually reduces the emission of um, these greenhouse gases. So, in terms of policy interventions, um, yes, um, the, the Center on Adaptation and the African Development Bank launched the um, Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program um, at the current Adaptation Summit in 2021. Um, and of course, um, they um, voted about $25 million, um, with mainly focus on food security, resilient um, infrastructure planning, finance in youth, employment, and etc. Um, for the situation in Ghana, uh, the situation in Ghana, the government of Ghana in 2012 actually um, came out with, uh, with a strategy called the National Climate Change and Application Strategy. Um, again, in 2013, there was the National Climate Change Policy that, um, that was passed. Um, there's also the Ghana Shared Growth and Development Agenda 2. Um, there's also planting for food, and, uh, for food and jobs. This is very, very key. In order that, um, it um, doesn't only um, um, it shows food but um, one other um, um, threat, I mean, that has, um, which has to do with unemployment is also um, curtailed. And again, there's also the food and in our culture in sector development policy. Um, there's also national climate, smart agriculture, and food security action plan. Um, 
with this, I want to bring my presentation to an end and thank um, you once again for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Basim. I don't know if you can see me, but um, thank you. I enjoyed your presentation. I think all of us uh, did enjoy your presentation. I mean, you listed like a litany of uh, so many forward-thinking policies by the government. My simple question is, how is this policies on paper translated on the ground? Can we even say for one second that whatever that you've mentioned, these nice policies, how are they implemented on the ground? Is there any um, like light on the end of the tunnel? Yes, um, so for instance, um, I mean, this thing uh, has been actually ongoing. Um, like I indicated, it uh, started in 2012. Um, yes, I would say there's um, light at the end of the tunnel, but um, the pace at which we are making progress is um, actually um, on the low, um, even though much can be done. Um, what we have to do, I think, is to uh, make the right investment. We will make the right investment in agriculture um, by doing smart agriculture. Um, we will then be able to say that, yes, um, we, we, we are really making headwinds in trying to um, attain the issues to do with food uh, security. One key thing that um, I spoke about was the, uh, the planting for food and jobs. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, a flagship program of, 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 of the government of the day. And there, there is a lot of um, sources, you know, like stories to talk about, you know, like this uh, project in that it has offered a lot of um, young, um, enterprising um, youth the opportunity to, to, to start their smallholder farmers, etc. And I think that, of course, it has helped in a way to, to provide us with food, but unfortunately due to other factors or other circumstances, such as um, imbalances, in, in our extreme way, it has rather made um, food, food inflation to be uh, moving at a very faster rate, and that is um, a worry. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we have about 40 more minutes um, before we are done here. Uh, I thought that there's a lot of questions that you probably have, or we have some more discussion time to do. So. I would say that if we take between five to seven minutes to stretch up a bit and exercise and say hello to our next um, neighbors we sit in, <laughs> then we, we are back here um, by, um, say, 8, 8.30. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have any questions, if you need some clarity in all the big scientific terms they used and the confusing maps, and then you can ask some questions and then we can get some clarification. George, George has a question. George, yeah. Okay, um, first of all, I want to thank uh, the presenter for a very educative um, information. And uh, my first question goes to <laughs> Dr. Tabe. Yes, okay, Tabe, um, Africa holds 60% of the arable land. Just to take you back in history, in 19th century, Africa was a continent that was relatively food secure. But now things have changed from being food secured to a net import of food, what happened? Yeah. Yeah. Can we get more questions or can I just flow directly? Okay, no, maybe we can get one more if you want. Um, yes. Please introduce yourself as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you uh, to the presenters. Uh, my name is Arinzo Okuli. Um, I live here in Tromso from Nigeria. I just raise my hand because uh, this, the question I have is a bit related to it, so I can just shoot it. Uh, same thinking, uh, when you talk about the uh, climate smart approaches, apart from maybe smart seeds uh, that are adapted to drought and some other things, I'm really 
uh, curious because the other smart practices such as uh, crop rotation, intercropping, uh, and fallow and all this. These are things that we did while I was <laughs> growing up uh, and, and even back then. But in your presentation, very wonderful presentation, I must say, uh, you presented it as if these are new uh, and if these are uh, uh, practices that we must learn and teach the farmers again to using agriculture extension, this kind of thing. So what happened? <laughs> Where, when did we lose it at what point? <clears throat> Go ahead. Uh, will Basa want to go first, or um, I mean, I can just also go first. I think you can go first, and then Basim can go after it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so kind of these are two separate questions. Um, uh, let me start with the first one from George. So that's that's a really interesting question. Um, a lot has happened um, from the 1960s where we food basket um, to now um, when we are just basically the importance of food and. Um, a lot, a lot of things can, can explain for this. Um, I, I, I cut some of this in my presentation, or alluded to this and when I was beginning um, by saying that um, the world is going through a lot of structural changes, um, and um, this has been um, some of the great causes. So firstly, one we think of climate change, right? Um, one big thing we see um, from global climate um, models is the fact that um, climate change is reducing agricultural production through a lot of mechanisms. So it's changing um, um, weather patterns, changing the cropping calendars, and because of that, it's reducing um, agricultural productivity um, with its twin impacts um, on food production. But of course, um, it goes without saying that climate change itself is not bad um, because um, it favors um, some nations, and for some nations, it doesn't favor them. So kind of if you have more green degree days, um, it basically increases the cropping um, season, which means um, yields are definitely going to increase. Um, but also, um, a lot of structural constraints that we face in Africa is based on Malthus. Thomas Malthus, where kind of posited that um, the world population is increasing. So you not compare the population in 1950 with the population now. Um, a lot of, a lot of, we have a lot of like our population is going at, at a geometric rate, and these were some of. The things Smartus um, was positing that kind of the way we see food production growing um, in comparison to the way population is growing, um, there'll reach a point at which um, there'll be a lot of trouble um, because we have a growing population. And this is the case in many African and Asian countries where our population is growing. Um, beyond also um, population, we have a lot of, a lot of health um, pandemics. Um, we also have a lot of problems that have to do with institutions. Our institutions in, in, in many African countries are not working right. Um, and I like um, the question from the second person is how did we get there? Um, like, like again, if, if we've moved from, from times where we, we had all the might and all the glory and all the food to now uh, we were just relying on these, um, these are some of um, the issues. Also, now coming to these practices, so kind of, um, these are not new practices like you mentioned, but one key thing um, that I've, I've always been motivated when I started studying, because I'm, I'm, I'm from a farming um, background, um, I used to accompany my mother to the farm, and, and we did most of these practices, um, following and the likes. One key thing is the fact that you'd agree with me that most of us um, did agriculture as a way of life, um, without understanding that um, we could get benefits from it. So um, we'd spend, we'd, we'd wake up in the morning, especially during the holidays, um, we'd spend 10 hours um, in the farm, but we, we still had to buy a lot of food because um, we didn't know a lot of the things we we're doing. Sometimes we we're doing following, but not efficiently in a way that we can get the best of yields, such that and we go to the farm every day, but at the end of the week, we don't see a lot of the things we're getting from the farm. And also, um, when we talk of, of these improved seeds, we find that farmers have really, um, uh, kind of, they are really, really, they like the things they do. So um, one key thing we observe um, in many studies is the fact that even when you give farmers these improved seeds, because most of these improved seeds are self-pollinating, um, when they have them for the first year, the second year they will not buy the improved seeds, they will rely on the self-pollinated ones. And with that, of course, their yields are going to be there, but they will not reach the optimal yields. And kind of, this is... this. You prune the trees and use the pruning material as fertilizer, uh, and you, you increase the, the production uh, tremendously. So um, it has been proven in, and is practiced in Brazil. And 
There are other practices like slash and burn, which are quite widespread in Africa. Uh, how do you bring people to not, no longer do it? And I think there is one, one element missing in the strategy, perhaps, and that are local, so regional, uh, non-governmental organizations to train them and to spread the news in the, in the local population because it's much, much easier than doing it via state authorities and so on. They cannot reach out, but they need the people there in the place. Thank you. Yeah, Basim, I think it was you who mentioned about extension officers and also um, there were some private extension and also mentions, mentioned about afforestation. No, yeah, I mean, you also did, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, can, I can give a start and Basim continue with them. Yeah. Afforestation, because I, I, I mean, that's, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I totally agree. So I want to start from your last point um, where you mentioned that we need to really strengthen these rural institutions, right? Um, <clears throat> they matter more than, than, than coming down from a top-down approach. Many times we need to go bottom up, and sometimes um, it's really not external, it's really internal. And like um, the previous questions mentioned, some of these things are really indigenous and we really have them. And one key thing is to, is to disseminate them to make them known to farmers. Um, information access, like, like, like I've argued in a lot of my studies, is a big problem in many small water settings, right? Because in many of these rural areas, farmers don't even know about some of these technologies, especially the improved ones, like the improved seeds. And again, I mentioned that even if they know, um, they have a lot of liquidity constraints, these houses are cash trapped. Um, one key thing, we really need to strengthen these rural institutions so that they boost the training and Kind of um, a lot of these initiatives are growing, to be honest, um, especially where you get a lot of non governmental organizations, you get a lot of private agricultural extension agents that are pushing um, um, all these technologies to, to farmers to boost um, environmental um, sustainability. But the key thing is that there's always this trade off because um, the government is usually very concerned about making sure that everybody has food to eat. Um, and that's why when we had this fall armyworm crisis in many African countries, many governments were distributing fertilizers and pesticides to farmers to fight against the fall armyworm. But many of these um, um, NGOs are rather saying we need to protect the environment. So there's always that conflict between um, uh, agricultural productivity, food security, and environmental sustainability, right? But the truth is that um, we need to eat. So in as much as we need to care about um, the environment, and we need to do that in a more sustainable way. And that th this is the whole concept about um, um, climate and agriculture. And to your second question on deforestation, um, I agree that deforestation is, 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 is causing a lot um, to, this, to this whole um, thing about <clears throat> climate change. And that's why there are a lot of talks about mitigating truck and curbing down deforestation rates. But in also some work I do on Cameroon, um, that's something we're worried about. But we are really not worried because um, kind of our, our main goal is always to make sure that um, we, we maintain the twin goals of agricultural production and food security, but also environmental sustainability, right? None of them should suffer and we should not protect the environment to the detriment of the food security of households. So kind of the main thing is always to do that sustainably. So in some work we are doing on Cameroon, we are looking at oil palm production and oil palm has been shown to be one crop that is associated with a lot of deforestation. Um, it, it, it feels like it's the same like soybean in many um, Brazilian um, or in the Amazon countries. And one key thing we argue a lot, even though we are working about um, oil palm, is the fact that these are products we consume, right? In as much as we lose um, trees, we lose forest livelihoods, we are also gaining livelihoods through, through the consumption of, of this oil. Um, but also it, um, it kind of improves the liquidity or the income, um, reduces the income constraints of households. And I was just thinking about it when um, Larry asked me the question about the fact that most of the oil normally comes from the Black Sea from, from Russia and Ukraine. And one thing that I was, I was really happy with COVID is the fact that COVID opened a lot of opportunities. Um, it made us to think that we can do things digitally. But I feel like it also created a lot of opportunities for many African governments that um, our governments do not take advantage of. And I think one important advantage was this whole thing about oil. So oil palm is really an indigenous crop that produces a lot in, in many West African countries, in the West African belt. So I felt like when we're not receiving these beautiful <coughs> oils from Russia and Ukraine, and there was, there was a lot of pressure, my friends in Germany used to tell me oil was not available, and the, the price skyrocketed to like 10 euros. I was like, this is an opportunity for us. Um, we could basically boost the production of palm oil, um, and that can be converted into vegetable oils. But unfortunately, our presidents or our systems, our national governments, um, do not take this um, into account. And for the, for the role of for the role of afforestation, yes, afforestation also has a lot of benefits because some of these trees um, offer nutritional benefits um, to farmers. 
I'm not sure um, about the case in Malawi because I've done very little work um, in Malawi. But if I if I can look up, up um, at the case of Cameroon and Nigeria, where I have some experience, is the fact that some of these trees of also offer us a lot of nutritional benefits. So kind of a tree like cashew nuts. I mean, that's cashew that we can eat, and it's also um, a protein. And kind of the advantage of these trees um, is also the fact that some of these trees are leguminous, so kind of they improve soil fertility and they reduce the use of chemical fertilizers. So I, I, I think we really need to, to understand or we need to do more research to understand um, where is the middle ground, where, because I think that's what is important, where can we arrive at that um, farmers are more sustainable in their production systems, but also their food production um, and their livelihoods um, do not suffer. Yeah, you I, I think we need to find a middle ground. So, uh, we have three other questions here. Basim, if you can uh, respond quickly, but let's be very snappy uh, when right, we respond to the questions. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Um, the one that has to do with uh, deforestation, um, this is a major concern um, in, in Ghana. It's a major concern in Ghana, um, not, not that um, the forests are actually um, slashed and used for for firewood, of course, that has been um, the situation in, in the past. Um, but presently, the government of Ghana, somewhere in 2013, actually launched the Rural uh, Promotion Program, which um, seeks to uh, provide the rural folks with um, LPG gas and then the cylinders and etc. Just so that we discourage the slashing down of trees. The issue, the main issue, now has to do with uh, mining or like mining activities where um, trees are slashed, you know, um, the land is then excavated to actually um, extract the gold ore. So um, yes, it's, it's a problem. Um, the government of Ghana has, has, has also rolled out some policies to, 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 uh, to try to mitigate, you know, um, uh, like mine swells, um, but that, that, that has not, um, much effort um, has not gone into it, I mean, I must admit, um, so, so that's, to actually be looked at. And the other issue that um, touched on um, the, the smart agriculture, the, the different like strategies, what I would just want to add is that um, you're looking at the situation, like for instance, in Ghana, right? Um, like I indicated, um, atmospheric um, temperature has gradually been increasing, and it is actually um, known that the amount of fertilizers that are used by farmers are actually low. So therefore, what 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 a lot of studies that have been done or like papers that have been uh, uh, published by lecturers in the University of Ghana, Shorts and Department specifically, is to actually um, harness um, this agricultural waste, um, try to um, turn them or carbonize them or yes into a product called biochar, uh, blend these um, uh, these biochars with the fertilizers either organic or the synthetic ones. And we have actually um, found um, impressive yield. Um, in, in fact, some of the yield are way higher than even um, in situations where you actually um, apply um, only synthetic fertilizer. So um, that is what I can add to that. Thank you. Thank you. We are really running out of time. Um, if we can make our questions very snappy, I will take the questions. So if you could note your questions, uh, if you could note the questions and then you will just answer them um, in one round and then we'll be um, summarizing. So there's one here and then you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Abdullah Muhammad Ali. I am a, a, a member on uh, Socialist Left SA and uh, leader for the Integration Council in Tromso. You are welcome, Martin and uh, Basim. You are welcome virtually. Uh, my question is: uh, You said there is three C's: the climate and COVID-19 and uh, conflicts. Uh, I am originally from Eritrea, so I'm busy about the conflicts. Uh, how is the conflict? Uh, how is the impl implication and impact? Of of uh, the uh, uh, in in the in uh, in, in conflict, especially in Ethiopia, you have been talking about the uh, Casa. Uh, how it, it will affect the Casa, uh, the climate, uh, smart uh, adaptation 
uh, in Ethiopia and Eritrea uh, or in generally in Africa because we are we, we have implications about the, the energy here in Norway about uh, this conflict uh, especially Ukraine and R Russia how it will affect Af uh, Africa now thank you yes this next question here thank you very much for um, coming here tonight uh, to us and to, to take the time to talk to us uh, my name is Sebastian. I'm currently based here in Trumse with a background in political, political science and law. My question concerns um, the collaboration internationally um, concerning different levels. So we've got the United Nations Development Program, we've got the World Food Program, several others on the, this level. And we've got also on the state level several cooperation programs between different countries. Um, what you if I got this right, I mainly stressed was on that knowledge needs to get to the actual persons on the ground. So my question is, um, how does that work? Like, what is done and what should be done better? Yes, sir. Yeah. Hello, my name is uh, Bashir. I work at the University of um, Tromso. Um, my question to you, um, especially to um, Martin. Martin, is that um, you mentioned that uh, sometimes when you implement these climate, um, climate smart um, policies, um, a lot of the people at the local level do not know what these policies are. So I want to find out from you, um, are there any knowledge systems on the ground that you also know and you harness in your um, climate adaptation um, strategies. Yeah, and then there's one more. Oh, okay, then you have the last thing. Uh, hi, uh, I may be I'm a research fellow at the NCU Trumps. Uh, I'd like to pose my question to Martin. Uh, there was a time when uh, Africa was the cornerstone of uh, global agricultural production. Uh, there's a time when um, Africa uh, was the part of the world where uh, forests were. Uh, there's a time when Africa uh, was a part of the world where animals and birds lived. All of this has changed to quite a degree, uh, primarily because of climate crisis, which has been triggered by urbanization coupled with uh, industrial growth and so on and so forth. Uh, my question is kind of, uh, and it's still on the fringes in uh, academic debates. Uh, how do we sustain uh, the populations of animals and birds uh, that has uh, been um, uh, acutely jeopardized by the climate crisis that we talk about? And if we are not able to do that, um, how would the elimination of animals and birds uh, impinge upon the ecological system that we keep talking about, but we forget that you know humans and animals and birds are part of that? Thank you. Yeah, and I will take the last one. And, um... Hello, my name is Emma. Thank you very much for your two presentations. I would just have a very general question because we've been talking a lot about political changes and social changes, but uh, where would you see the role of economic policy in changing to a more sustainable agricultural system? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, since most of the questions go to Martin, I would like uh, Basim to respond quickly in two minutes, and then we would end it up with Martin here. Yes, thank you very much. I think all the questions were addressed to mm -hmm. Martin. I don't know which, so about which of them is um, addressed to me. Um, I will gladly um, be happy to know, uh, Mr. Mubeka. That was, a, that was a general one, right? That was uh, the last one, I think. Okay, which is the role of economic policy in yeah. in, in, in economy? I think that was the Come. question, right? In agricultural exchange. In agriculture systems, yeah. Okay, all right, okay. All right, so, um, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, economic policies are very, very um, important, um, especially when we are trying to um, narrow them into um, agronomic um, um, systems. Um, I think what what has to be done is that we have to um, um, look at the 
the sort of investment that will have to go and then um, try to shape up the policy to be able to um, to to be able to target the particular um, agronomic or agricultural issue that it is that um, has to be um, addressed. I don't know if I've been able to to, to answer it well. Well, I think that's your that's your take. We would go to Martin, and then uh, we get the rest of the feedback. Yeah, thank you, uh, moderator. Um, so since we're working against time, um, um, I'll try to be brief. Um, but we can always continue the, the discussions, um, kind of as we go home. Um, so I like the question. I mean, I like all the questions. Um, but but the first question on on, on the role of conflicts um, that's really interesting because um, we are not just looking at. Um, the Russia and Ukraine um, crisis, but there are a lot of internal conflicts in many countries. So, like um, you mentioned, um, we have um, Eritrea has been on this crisis. Um, there's this Tigray region in Ethiopia, um, which is a crisis even in Cameroon. Um, there's a crisis in many African countries. You have a lot of a lot of crises. Also, you have a lot of um, inter-tribal wars. Um, and yes, all these conflicts have a lot of implications on food production and the agricultural sector. Um, I want to take the example of Ethiopia because we've also done some work on on how um, food security systems were affected by this. Basically, we could see that because of the war in the Tigray region, and um, basically these international organizations that priorly used to support um, households through food stamps um, and through various in-kind transfers to households for food, um, they could no longer go there. So basically, they were cut away from, from communication. But also, you'd, you'd, you'd imagine that in the context of war, um, households will not go for agricultural production purposes. So, kind of, and that is the main source of our nutrition in many rural areas. So, we, we produce the food we eat, and if we cannot go to the farms to produce, then our food security is basically hampered. And that's that's certainly the case um, in this um, in this um, various regions. I mean, one policy implication one one could think about conflict is the fact that you you always think that um, national government should always stress the point, should always address the needs of the people, but. The, the whole thing about conflict is also very political and, and, and institutional. So it's, it's something really hard to, to mention policy or entry and, and, and leveraging points. Um, the second question on the role of these international systems, um, the various um, bodies that, 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 that work on climate change, um, I think this is, this is something interesting because um, this, is whole, this is the whole center of the COP, right? um, this international climate change conference um, where we've had them um, many years. And the next one comes to Egypt. Um, that's the COP27. And one key thing I want to stress here is the fact that um, one key COP that stressed a lot about climate change adaptation was the Glasgow Pact. That's the last COP that took place in, in Glasgow. And there was a lot of commitments by the international organizations, also by um, by developed countries, because they contribute more to the to the emission of these anthropogenic greenhouse gases, that they're definitely going to support African countries in its fight for climate change adaptation, right? So kind of financing all of these. Um, this is one year, um, very little has been done, um, but um, a lot of progress has been made. Um, when I listened, I, I, was, I was reading the report from the African Adaptation Summit last time, um, which just happened like three days ago in the Netherlands, and they had stressed that they'll try to create a whole session of COP27, which is taking place in November, um, on making sure that all the promises about adaptation financing is basically going to place. So we are really getting to the point where we are not just about speech making, not just talking, not just making ambitious promises, but basically turning them into practice. So let's walk the talk. Um, that's 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 also interesting because if we make all these promises and we don't walk the talk, then um, we keep saying the same things every day. And then um, some other farmers uh, who are very vulnerable to climate change, um, not contributing a lot, um, are basically um, still suffering. Um, and like you mentioned that um, also in the national government, we have a lot of programs like the Africa Acceleration Adaptation Program um, that is actually kind of self-financing itself, opening off um, the financing window. Um, also, the question on what knowledge systems exist on the ground. So one key knowledge system is this whole thing about agricultural extension and um, services. Um, basically, so these are services that are usually provided by the governments. So kind of the train um, agricultural specialists to take these practices to farmers. But like you would imagine, um, being honest, in many smaller other systems, these, these, these systems are really broken, right? So many times they don't want to work, um, they don't want to take the information to, to farmers, um, they feel like farmers should, should cater for themselves. And because of this, there's been a lot of um, institutional programs being led by farmers themselves. So kind of you think of cooperative societies, you think of common initiative groups where farmers have to advise themselves. Um, and in our research, um, we showed that um, these are really important for farmers. 
and that's one key policy recommendation that it's not just interesting to focus a lot of external things on farmers, but you, you, we, we can also strengthen the own groups. So um, as farmers, we can form our own knowledge system group. Then that also creates for us um, a big opportunity to invite these extension agents to, to come and leverage um, the systems on us. And it's, it's working. Um, these this knowledge systems are working, especially um, the, farmer, the, the farmer groups. But one key thing is that sometimes they need to strengthen it, they need um, this improved coordination, they need this policy support um, from um, many programs. Um, the question about um, uh, about birds and animals, um, really that's, 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 that's also very nice and that's interesting, but I've not done any research on this and I'm not sure I can answer you conveniently well. But you're right um, when you say that um, sometimes we, we are so concerned about um, different things, but we should also know that um, these animal birds, they form part of the ecosystem. And of course, the ecosystem is, is very circular. Um, and it's, um, if, you, if you leave anything um, out of it, then it's within an ecosystem. And um, I think these are things we should, we should be looking at, at it from a more secular um, point of view, right? Um, not, just, not just a stock in time, but also um, kind of because if we look at the, f the functions that these animals have, these birds have to the ecosystem, um, they're not supposed to be left apart. But, but for my own research, there is little I can see, but I, um, I can support you to think that um, these are a, a very crucial part of the ecosystem and they should also be given um, a lot of attention and policy talks um, and how to improve um, and make sure that we're not losing them um, because of climate change, but also how to get better um, sustainable ways of making sure that our ecosystems um, maintained or better managed. And um, the last question on the role of economic policy, I think Bashi addressed that. But I think I think uh, most of the things we do are always relevant to economic policy uh, because we're always it's always about assessing the costs and the benefits. Um, and, and, and that is why the, the whole thing about climate change and adaptation it's it's very it's very interesting because if you look at the global cost um, of climate change um, and you look at the benefits of curbing down that cost, and you see that this is something that needs um, a lot of modern attention, right? I give you an example. I mean, even in Norway, um, the sea levels are rising, um, things are changing, but also in some other systems, you get a lot of floods. I, I, I really like the graph from Bashi where he showed two production systems because climate change is kind of two pronged. Um, you get a system where um, it's basically floods, farmers cannot farm under floods, but also you get an extreme system where there are a lot of droughts, and then farmers cannot even have yields because um, there, are, there are no droughts, but um, they don't have water to, to, to improve on their farming. And then you start thinking of irrigation, but those are technologies which are also very costly, um, which are very costly. So um, I think we need a lot of global attention on climate change because the cost is really um, kind of overweight and the benefits. But if we invest a lot in some of these climate smart agricultural practices, um, they may be reversed also trends such that we observe a lot of benefits. And I like, I was listening to, 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 to the climate policy speech and I like the fact that one speaker said we should not look at climate change as a challenge, but we should look at climate change as an opportunity. And I think the example they gave was the fact that if we take um, a farmer who is producing corn, he or she um, can face floods, but he or she can face um, a lot of droughts. So if we have solar panels or kind of solar dryers that um, the farmer can use um, kind of to dry his yields, um, rather, or rather than just relying on the sun, which um, it's never perfect, um, there are a lot of opportunities. So there are a lot of ways we can harness um, from, from, from some, of the, some of the things we can learn about climate change research. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you, and uh, thank you to Basim. We don't have much time here. We're sorry because we had some technical hitches. Otherwise, we would have been spot on um, on our timing. So we'd like to continue this discussion um, over a cup of coffee. So if you're interested, we can just uh, go down and then we can continue with the, with the talks. So this, uh, this program was brought to you by the Follow Strata for Africa, which is the Norwegian Council for Africa and the International Seminar. So International Seminar, every Thursday, there is a public seminar here at, uh, in this library. And it starts, I think, around 7 o'clock at the same time. So, just follow updates on uh, the Facebook group. There's something very interesting coming up. And then the Fellows Rather for Africa will have a program on mental health um, of the African diaspora in October. And we're trying to start up a chapter of the Norwegian Council for Africa up here in the north. And so if you're interested in also following our program, there's a Facebook page that you'll um, be able to follow and get some update. 
So thank you very much and to Martin, uh, who traveled all the way from Egypt to join us here, and to Basim, all the way from Accra, who was able to join us on Teams. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>